Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorial series discussing complex analysis. This is video number 10 and we're going to derive the residue theorem. As usual, I would like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed and I have a few other bits and pieces which may be of interest to you. Before we begin, I'd just like to review the videos previous to this. Of course, my videos on complex numbers are relevant as we are discussing complex analysis. In the series in complex analysis, we've had nine videos thus far. They are as follows. In video one, I discussed the Cauchy-Riemann equations. In videos two and three, I derived Green's theorem. In video four, I derived the divergence theorem. In video 5, I showed the relationship between Green's theorem and the divergence theorem. In video 6, I discussed the Cauchy integral theorem. In video 7, the differential arc length formula. And in video 8, we derived the Cauchy integral formula. Most recently, in video 9, I showed how using the Cauchy integral formula, we could derive both the Taylor and Lorentz series expansions. It may be worthwhile quickly reminding you the difference between a Taylor and Lorentz series expansion. With a Taylor series, we assume that our function is analytic. Although the Cauchy integral formula can cater for poles, we apply it and use that to evaluate the behavior of an analytic function around an arbitrary point which we call Z0, whereby the function was analytic at Z0. We considered a circle of radius r surrounding the point, and of course, with the Cauchy integral formula, we take the limit as the radius approaches zero. We expanded our function, which was being integrated, in terms of powers of z minus z zero. Each term in the power series had its own integral because of Cauchy's integral theorem. And we found that when we compared each term in the power series or the integral corresponding to each term in the power series with the generalized Cauchy integral formula, we saw that they were the same and we were able to rewrite the series in terms of the derivatives of the function and therefore we got the Taylor series. But the Taylor series only works for analytic functions, so when we consider a function which is not analytic, we couldn't consider a single circle of radius r surrounding the point where the function is not analytic, but rather we had to consider an analysis around, where we looked at the we looked at the area between two different circles of different radius of curvature. Thereafter, we followed the same procedure as with the Taylor series derivation, whereby we subtracted the Cauchy integral formula corresponding to each contour, applied a power series expansion in powers of z prime minus z zero where z0 is the point at which the function ceases to be analytic, and once again compared the terms with the generalized Cauchy integral formula, and we were able to rewrite it in terms of the derivatives of the function. It turns out that the Lorentz series is essentially a Taylor series where the, the indices n extend not just from zero to infinity, but from zero to negative infinity. The Cauchy integral formula then is required in order to calculate the values where we have the pole underneath the line and the function is not analytic. So analytic functions have a Taylor series expansion and a Lorentz, excuse me, and uh, functions which are not analytic have a Lorentz series expansion. Of course, the Lorentz series is more general than the Taylor. The point of all this work is that we may calculate the residue B sub 1 in the Lorentz series, multiply it by twice pi, and then we have our integral. Let's discuss the residues of simple poles. Remember now, a simple pole is one where the exponent on the power, which is of course going to be in the denominator, is 1. In order to calculate the residue, we need to get the B sub 1 coefficient in the Lorentz series. And at this point, we've seen this, the Lorentz series written in this manner a number of times. 
Now there's one important point which until now I haven't mentioned. That there actually are different types of poles and for the present treatment and they're actually called different things. So a pole is defined in one way. For simplicity, let's say it's where we have a divide by zero scenario. Where you have a pole in your function, your negative n terms in your Lorentz series will not in fact go to negative infinity. This power series is going to terminate. This means that while our Taylor series is going to go off until positive infinity, there is an indice m such that there are no other terms greater than m. The power series terminates. To restate this, the sum of the first series here is analytic at z is equal to z0, as we know of course at this point. The second series here, containing the negative powers, is called the principal part of our Lorentz series. Now, if this principal part of our Lorentz series, if this has only finite terms, or finitely many terms, then there is going to be an m such that this will be the highest order term in the power series. There will be no m plus 1 term, and the power series will have terminated. If the power series in fact does terminate, such or where there is an m such that this is the case, then we refer to z0 as a pole and m is called the order of the pole. Now this is something you're saying I've told you this already. What I haven't told you is that where the principal part of our Lorentz series has infinitely many terms we say that the function small f of z at z is equal to z0 has an isolated essential singularity. It has infinitely many terms and is called an isolated essential singularity. And this is something which is not required to be looked at at their present treatment. On the top of your screen, I present a reminder of what their a sub n and b sub n terms look like. Now, like I said, if we're talking about a pole, the b sub n power series is going to terminate. And what we'll get is a Lorentz series of the form on the bottom of your screen. Whereby we still, of course, have the Taylor series, but the b sub n terms will terminate at some point. If we speak of a simple pole of order 1, then they will ter terminate at the point or at the indice or the power 1 and all other terms are going to be zero. I say that one more time. For a Lorentz series of a function with a simple pole, which means the pole is of order one, then you're just going to get the Taylor series of the function with one other term, b sub one over z minus z zero. I have rewritten that expression here Thereafter, what I do is I manipulate this by multiplying across by z minus z0, such that we have z minus z0 multiplied by the Lorentz series of our function is equal to the constant b sub 1 plus z minus z0 to the n outside of the Taylor series sum. Now, if we take the limit such that z approaches z0, then what we're going to get is this section here going to zero. And therefore, b sub 1, the coefficient we require in order to evaluate our integral, is the limit as z approaches our pole at z0 of z minus z0 times the Lorentz series of the small f of z function. Now the power and utility of this might not be immediately obvious, but I'm going to demonstrate very shortly how powerful and useful it is. We can rewrite this using our previous nomenclature in the following way, such that we have the residue is equal to b sub 1 is equal to the limit of our function as z approaches z0 of z minus z0 multiplied by our function. The trick here is that we get to avoid doing the integration by simply taking a limit.